Okay, so in the last class, um, we started the class by talking about, well, the first thing we talked about was the fact that scientists and engineers use the language of math to express ideas and concepts. So we talked about that. But when we got into the lecture, we talked about quantities, physical quantities. And what we said was that a quantity to express a quantity, it takes two pieces of information. You need a number and you need a unit. We also mentioned the fact that unlike other fields like business or um, whatever, in the science and engineering, we have extremely large quantities we have to write numbers for and extremely small quantities we have to write numbers for. We gave some examples of uh, the distance between stars. So one way to write those large numbers or extremely small numbers in a convenient uh, format is to use scientific notation. And so we spent some time in the last class uh, for some of you reviewing and for others it might be the first time uh, you uh, uh, went through that. But we talked about scientific notation and we did some practice problems. In the end of the lecture, I put this table on the board. I don't have the title of the table here now, but this is called the table of metric prefixes. And so we, uh, we listed this table out and I asked you to make sure you know so I don't like you to memorize a whole lot of stuff, but this you got to memorize. And so we have the prefix, we have the power, we have the symbol, and I also mentioned that on quiz two, this will be on quiz two. This is one of the things that will be on quiz two. So on quiz two, what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll mix the rolls up, I'll erase certain things, and you got to fill the table in, get everything completely right. So uh, I think that's where we stopped, and um, I wanted to do... The second, there's, a, there's another way we use to represent numbers uh, that's very useful in engineering, especially electrical engineering, and it's called engineering notation. So what I want to do today is I want to finish up talking about the way we represent numbers. I want to say a little bit about systems of units, and then we'll say a little bit about measured numbers. We'll do some more practice problems, and then we'll be done. We'll move on to the next chapter. So in scientific notation, just to review, if I want to write a number in scientific notation, the way you do it is you move the decimal either to the left or to the right, and the form it will take, once you get it in scientific notation, it'll look like this, where you have one decimal place to the left, or one place to the left of the decimal, and the number, the digit, cannot be a zero. It's the digits one through nine inclusive. You may or may not have a number here, and then you have this power or exponent, which tells us the number of times we move the decimal either to the left or to the right, and that decimal will, that uh, number will either be negative or positive, depending on if the original number was bigger than one or between zero and one. So we went through that already. So now I want to talk about engineering notation. Engineering notation. Think of engineering notation as a subset of scientific notation. So like scientific notation, in engineering notation, you have a decimal point. You can have one place to the left of the decimal point. You may or may not have a number on the right times 10 to some power. So kind of like scientific notation with a few differences. Here's the difference. Um, like scientific notation, you don't want a zero here. This needs to be between one and nine inclusive. But unlike scientific notation, this right here has to be a multiple of three. This needs to be a multiple of three. And also unlike scientific notation, in engineering notation, I can have one place to the left of the decimal. I can have two places to the left of the decimal. Or I can have three places to the left of the decimal. So 
So the first case here looks like scientific notation, except that we gotta we gotta have a multiple three here for the power. So with some engineering notation, I can have one place to the left of the decimal, two places to the left of the decimal, or I can have three places on the left side of the decimal point. And you might ask yourself, well, what determines how many places to the left of the decimal we have? And what determines that is you got to move that decimal point around to make it fit this form right here, the form of having one place to the left of the decimal, two places to the left of the decimal, or three places to the left of the decimal, while at the same time, you have to have this power right here to be a multiple of three. So as an example, remember we talked about the distance. I think we talked about the distance between the Earth and the sun. The distance between the Earth and the sun, I can't remember if that was your class or another class, but the distance is 93 million miles. So we started with the number 93 million. And I asked you to put that number in scientific notation. And to put it in scientific notation, you said, all right, that's easy to do. I put the decimal point right here. I move it over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And in scientific notation, I can write this as 9.3 times 10 to the seventh power. And since the original number I started with was bigger than one, I write that as a positive seven. Had this between had this been between zero and one, I would have written that as a negative seven. So putting it in scientific notation is easy. Well, if I want to put this in engineering notation, then what I gotta do is if it's the first case here, except that that's a seven. In engineering notation, you're not allowed to have a seven. The power has to be a multiple of three. So the only way to get this to be a multiple of three, the exponent, the only way to get it to be a multiple of of three, while at the same time maintaining the form of having one place to the left of the decimal, two places to the left of the decimal, or three places to the left of the decimal, what I have to do is, I started with my original number, started moving the decimal place over seven places, I have to back it up one. If I back it up one, this changes from a seven to a six, and now it fits this form right here. I got, move that over, I got a nine, I got a 3 times 10 to the 6. So I got two places to the left of the decimal point, and this is a multiple of 3. So to put a number in scientific notation, two things you got to kind of watch. You have one place to the left of the decimal, two places to the left of the decimal, or three places to the left of the decimal. What determines that is I got to negotiate and move that decimal point around to make sure that while I maintain the form, I got to have the power as a multiple of three. Now, let's say that instead of the distance between the Earth and the Sun, let's say that that 93 million, in this class we're going to talk about the fundamental units we'll talk about, there's three things we'll talk about, well there's more than three, we'll talk about voltage, we'll talk about current, We'll talk about resistance, and next week we'll define those, and you'll, you'll know exactly what we mean by the term voltage, current, and resistance. But just assume that this is 93 million volts of electricity. 93 million volts. So in decimal, decimal notation, as a decimal number, this is 93 million volts. But now I have it here in engineering notation, I can write it as 9. 93 times 10 to the 6 volts. Now, once you get it in engineering notation, here's the reason why you want this to be a multiple of 3. What you can now do is go over to this table, figure out what the symbol is for the power of 10, which is 10 to the 6. Well, I see that that's mega, 10 to the 6. And you can replace the power of 10 with this symbol right here, the capital M. So instead of writing, 93 times 10 to the 6, what you would really write is 93, we'll replace this with the symbol for 10 to the 6, so this would be mega, and then the units would be volts. <clears throat> this is the way we express quantities, extremely large quantities or extremely small quantities in electrical engineering. We write it this way, engineering notation. So. If you have your handout, the topic sheet, what I want you to do 
is have a look at the last practice problem on the page, problem number three. I'll read it just in case you don't have your sheet. Problem number three says convert problem number one, uh, letters A through E, convert problem number one to engineering notation. Once you get it in engineering notation, they want you to replace the power of 10 with the correct prefix from the table of metric prefixes. And we're going to assume the unit, those numbers in problem number one don't have any units on it. It says to assume the units are volts. Assume the units are volts. So take out a sheet of paper. Again, I'll write these on the board just in case you don't have your paper. But take, 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 take out your paper. And I want you to assume that all those values in problem number one are volts. And I want you to first write it in engineering notation. And once you get it in engineering notation, make the substitution of your power of 10 for the correct symbol. And let's practice doing it. So I'll give you a few minutes to do it. Maybe I'll just raise this and I'll just keep that on the board. So go ahead and do that and we'll talk about it in just a second. Excuse me. Yes, sir. So what is the question again? I can't hear you. you want to repeat your question? Yeah. I say, what is the question? What is the question? Yes. I don't have a paper. Yeah. That's talking about. You know, do you have the topic sheet or not? Do you have your paper? No. Okay. I'm going to put it on the board for you, okay? Thank you. So here are all our voltages. And what we want to do is write each in engineering notation. And once you get in, in engineering notation, make the substitution for your correct metric prefix. Now, somebody's mic is open. Make sure your mic is muted. Let me see if I can tell who that is. I think I might be able to tell. OK, I see everybody here. Riley, I see Riley, I have a microphone, so let me see if I can mute that. I think I can unmute it. I like this. Okay.
instructions on the quiz, not not quick quiz one. I'll give you over. You'll, you'll do that over the weekend. I'm talking about quiz quiz two, which will be next week. On the quiz, I'm going to ask you to take a number, write it in engineering notation, and then substitute the power of ten for the correct metric prefix or the, uh, the correct metric symbol. Don't go. Well, students often will skip the step, the engineering notation step. You, you got to show both steps. So let's write this number in engineering notation. And then once it's in engineering notation, um, swap out the power of 10 for the correct symbol. So what is the first number in engineering notation? What would I write? Tell me what to write. <laughs> 56 kilovolts. OK, that's not engineering notation, though. So it would be 56 what? Times 10 to the third. Third volts. So on the quiz, don't jump from this to 56 kilovolts. I want you to do all three steps. I want you to get used to writing it down, guys. That way it'll help you remember what these are, what these symbols are, and what power of 10 they relate to. So on the quiz, given this, you got to show me two things. You got to show this, and after that, then you replace the 10 to the third with the correct symbol, which is a lowercase k, and then I think that's Jacob. I'm not really sure, but it's 10 or 56 kilovolts. So this is the way we'd actually write it and say it: 56 kilovolts. What about this next one? Could that be 1.2 times 10 to the sixth? Exactly right. 1.2 times 10 to the sixth, and then your unit would be volts, and you write yeah, that. It'd be megavolts. Exactly right. Mega, capital M, volts. But what would this one be? Be careful on that one. What do I got to do here? 50 to the, neg 10 to the negative third. 50 times 10 to the minus third volts, which is what? 50 millivolts. 50 millivolts. Okay, now, guys, remember in the last class, I was kind of joking around, but remember I said you got to make your uppercase M's look like uppercase M's and your lowercase M's look like lowercase M's? It's important to do that. Now you can kind of see why. Because let's say you're, um, I didn't really ask you guys what your majors were, but I need to probably do that. But let's say uh, you're biomed, your, your major is biomed. And you had to uh, tune some type of medical equipment so that the output voltage to uh, the patient's brain is uh, 50 millivolts. Now, remember, a milli, a milli is one one thousand, one one with a thousand with a th, one one thousand of a volt. So you have a really, really tiny voltage. But if you write it so that you meant millivolts, but you put the, the wrong in there and got megavolts, you just killed your patient. So it's important that you make an uppercase letter look like an uppercase letter and the lowercase look like the lowercase letters. Very important. What about this next one? Uh, 56 times 10 to the negative 12. Okay, we did that one. What about th this one? Oh, you oh. mean, th oh, you did this one. We can do that yeah. one. Let's do that one. At the bottom, it will be, right, 56 times 10 to the minus 12 volts, which would be what? Uh, 56 picovolts. Exactly right. That's a tiny, tiny, tiny voltage. The only time you probably have a voltage that small is when you're dealing with radio frequency. When you transmit a signal, like when you use your cell phone and you transmit a signal, the voltage leaving your phone is relatively high, but the one that hits the receiving antenna can be really, really, really tiny, maybe picovolts or even smaller. I think we skipped this one. What would this one be? 472 uh, times 10 to the negative 6. So we can go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, about oh, yeah. 0.72 times 10 to the what? Okay, it's negative third. Okay, so minus 3 volts, which would be 4.72 what? Millivolts. Millivolts. 
You see how that works? So in this class, here's what we'll do. We're going to deal with voltage. We're going to deal with current. We're going to deal with resistance. And we're going to deal with something called power. Now, we'll, we'll start to explain what these things are, exactly what they are next week. But, but each one of these quantities has a unit. The unit for voltage is a capital V. The unit for current is a capital A. The unit for resistance is, that's the Greek letter omega. And the unit for power is a capital W. By the way, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, if a unit uses a capital letter as a representation, it is named after somebody. So all of these are capitalized, and they're all named after somebody. It was a person named, not Voltage, it was a person named Volta. There was a person, this, this A is for Ampere, so there was a person named Ampere, uh, George Ohm, and then there was a person named Watts, James Watts. So the symbol... If a unit is capitalized, it's named after somebody. If it's not capitalized, like a, a meter or, or a gram, then they're not named after anybody. And also, when I want to show a unit, I usually put brackets around it just to show you that this is not like a variable X or Y. This is actually a unit. So I like to put these brackets around it to represent a unit. But what I wanted to show you was that what you'll do is you might have something like uh, – so we did volts, you might have something like 3.5 milliamps of current. You wouldn't write that as 0 0.0035 amps. You could write it that way, but that's like going to the grocery store and something costs a dollar, you give the person 100 pennies. You still gave them a the dollar, but they're not going to be very happy with it. They'd rather have the money in another form. It's kind of like that. You can write it like this, it's not wrong. But engineers like to show it this way. This is the language we use to express these physical quantities. You might have 3.5 uh, milliamps. You might have 10 megawatts. Or you might have uh, 15 kilo ohms. So you want to get used to expressing numbers and quantities the way uh, that we practice here today. So we looked at engineering notation, and then we... From engineering notation, we use this table of metric prefixes to swap out the power of 10 to write these quantities, voltage, current, resistance, power, in ways that electrical engineers like to see. Anybody have any questions or comments over what we just did, over engineering notation? Yeah, can you show me that it's all three steps for uh, one of them? Which one? Uh, one of the problems we did. So you have, you have a question over one the one that we did? Yeah, just one of them. Any any of them works. Just you want, the, you want to do another one? Yeah. Can you show me okay. the all three steps? Yep. Let's do another one. Let's do two more. All right. Let's say I have. Uh, uh, let's see. Let's say I have twelve point no. So I have 12,500 volts. And then let's say I have 0 0.0000123, let's say amps. So this is voltage. This is current. And I want to write this in engineering notation. So the steps would be, would you go ahead and do it first? I'm going to pause for a second. Go ahead and try this, and then we'll walk through the steps together. We got 12,500 volts, and we got a really tiny current, 0.0000123 amps. So see what you come up with. Now, guys, this is really, really important. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most important, this is like a 9 nine between nine and the ten so it's important that you can do this what i want you to do is practice doing this and if uh when you come in for lab if you need more help actually 
I might not see you for live next week. When you come in, uh, if you need, if you, if you want me to give you additional work, just send me a, a text and I'll send you another sheet. Your audio is like skipping out. My well, audio skipping out. I think we're getting feedback from uh, Caleb Thorman. Okay, I think you are. Yeah, he, I think you muted. So you sound clear now. Okay, thank you. Let me turn my audio down a little bit. That helps with the feedback a little, but then I have a hard time hearing you guys. Caleb got mad and left. I think you kicked him out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the steps would be a decimals here. I'm going to move it over. One, two, three. I want to stop right there. Now, if I go one more, I can write as 1.25 times 10 to the fourth volts. But that's not right because it's okay to have one place to the left on the decimal point, but you got to have this as a multiple of three. So you can't show it this way. So what you got to do is back up one. So this becomes a three. And I'll write this as 12. 0.5 times 10 to the third, and you got to show the unit, volts. That's engineering notation. Now, once I get it in engineering notation, what symbol do I replace this 10 to the third with? Okay. Okay. So the way you would say it or write it to me, if you're speaking to me, you're going to say, hey, hey Professor Singleton, I have 12.5 kilovolts and there's no way in the world you should have that much voltage. If you have 12.5 kilovolts, you're dangerous. But that's what the answer is. What about this one? Now we got current. Same thing, right? I'm going to move this over how many places? Six. One, two, three. That's a multiple of three, but I can't have a zero out front. Four, five, six. Okay, I can stop right there and get 1.23 times 10 to the 6 amps of current. This is between 0 and 1, so it's not really a 6, it's a what? Negative 6. Negative six. And what am I going to replace this with? Uh, micro. Micro, 1.23 micro amps of current. Micro amp. See how that works now? Does that help out? Yes. All right. All right. I probably should give you guys more. I don't know how much of the homework. I don't know how much of this you're doing homework, but I probably should. Uh, Probably should give you more of this stuff because students sometimes have a problem with this. We're going to make a new, well, it's not going to do you guys any good, but we're making a new course. It's called Fundamentals of Engineering that students will take before they take this course. And it just works with this kind of stuff. Like you spend, you know, a lot of time doing this kind of stuff. So that when you come to a course like this, you already know how to do this stuff. So I think we're going to start that in the summer. Okay, so any questions over engineering notation? All right, well, let's kind of step back and look at what we've done so far. What we're dealing with, we're dealing with, we're dealing with physical quantities, and we mentioned the fact that a quantity, to express any quantity, it takes two pieces of information. You've got to have a number and a unit. And depending on the number we have, if we have a really, really, really big number or a really, really a small number, then this number we can express in either scientific notation or engineering notation. And if you're an electrical engineer or some kind of engineer, then that engineering notation, we can replace the power of 10 with metric prefixes. And it makes talking about these quantities a little, little easier. So instead of saying 93 million volts, we can say, 93 megavolts, and it makes more sense, okay? Now, let's deal with this part. 
I want to deal with units, systems of units. Somebody is unmuted somewhere. I, I, didn't, I can mute you guys. I just learned how to do that. All right, I just muted Riley. That's a lot of power I have here. I can mute you. I can kick you out of the session. I like that. Just a touch of a button, you're gone. So if you guys piss me off, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to terminate. I can just press a button and you're out of here. I was looking at Michael Wheeler and I saw a pair of ears and a tail go by and behind him. I don't know if you guys can see each other. I guess he has a, uh, is that a, uh, yeah. uh, my dog. Is that a He's a husky uh, American Bulldog mix. What's his name? His name's Jax. Jax. Oh, look at him. <laughs> He's been bugging guys, I'm, one day I'll tell you how many dogs I have. You won't believe me if I tell you. I won't, I won't tell you today, but ask me, I'll tell you later. I'll tell you how many I have, and I live in an apartment. Well, I actually take care of my mom, but I have an apartment. If you knew how many dogs I had in my apartment, you probably would get me arrested. Anyway, I want to talk about systems of units, systems of units. And there's two main systems scientists and engineers use. So one is called the English system. This is systems. of units. And so there is the English system and then there is the metric system. So these are the two main systems. Now uh, actually we break the the metric system down to what we call subsystems. There's three subsystems in the metric system. So in the metric system, there is a subsystem called CGS. There's the one called MKS. And then there's one called SI. SI. Um, here the C stands for centimeters, grams, seconds. C, G, S, centimeters, grams, seconds. Here is meters, kilograms, seconds. So uh, if you think about a centimeter or a meter, that's a length. That's a length. A gram or a kilogram is a what? What is a gram or kilogram? A weight. A weight. Okay. That, so somebody said it is a weight. Is that correct? Or a volume? Not a volume. This is a weight. It's actually a, a mass. It's actually a mass. What's the difference between this and this? A weight and a mass? Weight is mass uh, with, with gravity or something. Okay, so if you had if you had uh, physics, it taught you that weight equals mass times g, where that g is the acceleration of gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. Somebody texted me and said, uh, weight is okay. I think that whoever just sent me a message uh, was Robert. Robert said, weight uses gravity, mass is force and acceleration. So weight uses gravity. So here's what weight is. Let's say I have a bowling ball in this hand. I got a golf ball in this hand. Which one weighs more? Well, of course, the bowling ball is going to weigh a lot more than the golf ball. But when you, when you experience weight, what you experience is the earth's pull on whatever it is you have in your hand. The earth is pulling on it. And, and, and the more massive the thing is, the, the stronger that pull from the earth is going to be. Gravity is pulling down on it. So gravity pulls down harder on the bowling ball than it does on the golf ball. Therefore, the, the bowling ball, the U, appears to be heavy. But here's the problem with weight. Weight depends on gravity, and gravity depends on which planet you're on. If I'm on a really, really big planet like Mars, then the pull from Mars, the pull from that planet is going to be greater. If I'm on a tiny, tiny, tiny celestial body like the moon, then the pull of the moon is going to be a lot, a lot less. So, 
Are you saying that you weigh differently depending on where you are in the universe? That's exactly what I'm saying. If you weigh yourself on Earth and then you go to Mars, you're going to be heavier because the planet Mars is bigger than the Earth. If you go to the moon, you're going to be a lot lighter. So weight depends on where you are in the universe, whereas mass, what is mass? Mass is the amount of what? Space. Mm. Mass is the volume. Mean. The amount of what? The volume. Okay, space, matter. volume. It's, I heard it. It's the amount of? Matter. Matter. Mass is the amount of ma matter. Matter is basically whatever makes up the thing we're talking about, whatever makes you up. Let's say that. Let's say I take you. I don't know how much you weigh. Let's say you weigh 150 pounds. If you go to the moon, you'll weigh less. I forget the exact number. You'll weigh less. You go to Mars, you'll weigh more. But what doesn't change, as long as you don't, say, lose any hairs or shed any skin cells, what doesn't change is the number of atoms that make up your body. No matter where you go in the universe, that number is still the same. And so the mass will be the same no matter where you go. The weight's going to vary depending on which planet you're on. So scientists and engineers like stuff that's constant. So usually what we do, we don't weigh things, we mass things. I know you weigh yourself and you might go to the grocery store and you might weigh some fruit or something per pound. But scientists and engineers, we mass things because mass doesn't change. So the gram or kilogram grams are units of mass. So I put a capital M over here, the mass. And then uh, the second, that's the S for seconds, that's time. And so there's other quantities I can talk about, but we're just looking at length, mass, and time. So in the English system, the fundamental or the standard unit for length is the foot. Ft, the foot. So you might have something that's 30 feet. In the English system, the standard unit for mass now, if you're if I have any mechanical engineers out there, you're not going to like this because in your engineering course, here's what they told you. They told you in the English system, mass is the pound, there's a pound force, there's a pound mass. They told you that's what you use for mass, but the physicists would say, nope, you're wrong. The actual standard for mass is called the slug. There's actually a unit called a slug. And for time, it's the second. Now we have other units we can use for like for length, like I can say inches, I can say uh, miles, right? But the standard we use is the foot. The standard we use for mass is the slug, and the standard we use for time is the second in the English system. Over here under the metric system, we got to talk about that a little bit. Because it depends on which subsystem you're in. Now, you might wonder, you say, well, why do we got to have these subsystems? What's, the, what's up with that, these three subsystems? Well, we got the CGS system or subsystem. We got the MKS subsystem. Now, just in case you don't know, a centimeter is way smaller than a meter. A centimeter is like about like this big, and a meter is like about this big. It takes 100 centimeters to make one meter. So what scientists do, if they're measuring something really, really, really tiny, maybe the size of an amoeba or a flea, they're going to be in this system, CGS. If they're measuring something larger, like maybe the distance from the, uh, the Earth to the sun, they're going to use the MKS system. So in the, in, in the CGS system, the standard unit for length is, of course, the centimeter. The standard unit for mass is, of course, the gram, and the standard unit for time is, of course, the second. In the MKS subsystem, the standard unit of length is the meter, or case M. The standard unit for mass would be not the gram, but the kilogram, and now you know the kilo is 10 to the third, that's 1,000. So the kilogram is 1,000 grams, so this would be a kg, and the standard unit for time it's the second. And then there's this weird one right here, the SI system. 
And what that is, is called the International System of Units. The International System of Units. Now, if you want to know why is it IS for International System of Units, it's because I think it's come, it comes from a French word. Anybody speak French? Nobody speaks French. So, say yes, I say yes, I do. You speak French? Yes, I do. Okay. Is it System International? I think in French, in French they reverse this, right? The International System of Units, they call it System International or something like that. Okay. But here's what's important. In the SI system, in the SI system, the standard unit of length is the meter. The standard unit for mass is the kilogram. And the standard unit for time is the second in the SI system. Now, let me pause for a second. Is there anything anybody wants to ask me? I'll wait. Why are they the same? Yeah. If you know this, it looks like the MKS and the SI are exactly the same. Meter, meter, kg, kg, second, second. Well, actually, they're not the same. There's another fundamental quantity I'm leaving off. Temperature. Temperature. If I put that in the table over here, temp. If I'm in the English system, we use something called Fahrenheit. So it will be degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know if you can see this in the camera or not, but degrees F. And if I'm over here in the metric system, CGS or MKS is degrees Celsius. So degrees Celsius. Degrees Celsius. But over here in the SI system, it's neither one of those. Anybody know what it is? Kelvin. 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 This Kelvin is a, it's not degrees Kelvin, it's just Kelvin. And that's what we call in physics or chemistry an absolute temperature. An absolute temperature. It's an absolute scale. These right here, degrees C and degrees F, are the kind of relative scales. But this is an absolute scale. And so it looks like MKS and SI are the same but for all practical purposes as they are until we get the temperature. And when we deal with temperature, they're different. Kelvin. And then we have a Celsius or centigrade. So they are different. So you don't have to really memorize this stuff, but later on, like when we talk about, uh, we'll talk about in this class, you'll learn about magnetism. You'll learn about um, uh, a little bit about radio frequency. We'll talk about that. That's when this stuff comes up and you just, you want to be, be familiar with it, but don't try to memorize any, any of this stuff. If you have a physics or chemistry, you probably already looked at some of this. But just be aware that these exist. You'll hear me talk about in this class, CGS, MKS, SI. We don't really use this one a whole lot. Scientists kind of got away from that, and they tend to use more over here on the metric side. But you do, this you should know anyway, just from living. You know, the foot and, and Fahrenheit, you probably know. Know this time and all the systems are the same. Time and all the systems are the same which is kind of interesting. It's because we live, um, you know, before Einstein, um, the big dude before Einstein was a guy called uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Anybody remember Newton? What was he famous for? Newton. Yeah. Somebody sent me a text. Newton, uh, say calculus. Yeah, Adams. Well, somebody said calculus. He actually was famous for a whole bunch of stuff. Those guys are really smart back in the day. So Newton, Newton gave us a, he, he, the calculus is kind of interesting because what happened there was uh, what the, mainly he's known for laws of gravity and then laws of motion. There's three, if you study physics, Newton's laws of motion, there's three of them. But also he did some work in optics. So here's the cool part. Imagine I give you a problem, an engineering problem or a physics problem or some kind of science problem. Imagine I give you a problem. And I say, all right, I want you to go do this and don't come back here until you solve it. But the, the, the math to solve that problem wasn't invented yet. You wouldn't know what to do. 
Newton was trying to solve a physics problem, and the math hadn't been invented yet, so he first invented calculus to solve a problem. That's pretty smart. Now, we say Newton, but there was other people working on the calculus, but he was a big part of inventing calculus. So, uh, but the reason I brought that up is when they divide physics, they divide it, they call something called, uh, they divide, they basically have three, three point, three dividing points in physics. There's Aristotle, who was a philosopher, and then there was Newton, and then there's Einstein. And then for Newton, the, there was a fundamental constant. The thing that was the same is what I mean, but when I say fundamental constant, it's the thing that's the same everywhere in the universe. For Newton, it was time, T-I-M. So we use seconds here. And Einstein came in, he came up with this idea of relativity, the theory of relativity. And Einstein said, no, nope, Mr. Newton, you're wrong. Time actually can change depending on how fast you're going. And I don't want to get into the physics of that, but what we learned is, and we know for sure that time is not, it seems to be constant, but it isn't. Time depends on speed. Einstein said the constant, the thing that's constant no matter where you are in the universe is the speed of light. And so, uh, but you see, the, the second gear is the same no matter what system we're in. I don't know where the physics stuff came from, but it's interesting if you think about it. So, uh, all right, guys, I got, uh, here, here's the, uh, the units part. We got a quantity, the number, which we can express if I have a big number or a small number, we can express it in engineering notation or scientific notation. We can do our uh, substitution of the power of 10 with the correct symbol. If I know the metric prefix, and then the unit will be probably not an English unit, more one of the units from the CGS, MKS, or SI subsystem from the metric system. There's one more thing I want to talk about. Uh, Nathan, question? Would we expect to see this on quiz two? Pro well, no, I'm not because. I don't really like to, to memorize a whole lot of stuff. I really don't. I want you to use it so much that you just know it. And this is something I think as we go through the course, you'll see me use these units and you'll get used to seeing it. So I'm not going to put this on the quiz and say, all right, Nate, give me the the, uh, the, 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 the units in the CGA. I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that on the quiz. Okay. So this, you'll, you'll just hear me talk about it in the class. I want you to have some reference point when I use these terms. Now, I want to talk about one more thing. I got like, I think I got like five minutes left. I want to talk about measured numbers. Measured numbers. I'm going to go through this kind of fast. So what I'll do is I'll go through it quickly. And then if you have any questions, because uh, I don't know if anybody have a, has a class after this or not, but if you have any questions, um, you, can, you can ask me. I'll, I'll stay around after class. But I want to get through the whole topic sheet. So the last thing I want to say is about measured numbers. And I want to write down some terms here. Uh, okay, I'm going to write down, uh, actually I'll just write down Two of these. So we got accuracy and we got precision. But if you don't have a sheet, what's also on the sheet is significant digit and error. So under measured numbers, there's four terms significant digit, error accuracy and precision. And the reason I didn't write these two down is because of the four listed, these are the most important right here. So I'm going to quickly talk about these two, and then I want to jump down to this to make sure you have an accurate definition on what, what, what I mean by accuracy in this class. When you go to another class, that might mean something else. But when we use the term accuracy in this class, I want you to know what we mean. And when we use the term precision in this class, I want you to know what we mean or what I mean. So uh, now, if I have any chemists out there, and see, I've been teaching here since 2013. I had two full-blown chemists in my class over the years, two chemists. And if you had chemistry, you dealt with something called significant digits or significant figures. 
sig figs for short. And you know, if you had all that stuff, that you can spend a whole day talking about what you need to do if you multiply to get the correct number of sig figs. What you got to do if you it's it's it's, it's a lot. I'm going to simplify it greatly because what I mean by a significant digit or significant number is any number of a measurement that you're, that you're sure about. Now, we're talking about measured numbers, so let's start by, by defining what we mean. What is a measured number? Well, it's exactly what you think it is. A measured number is any quantity you get by using some instrument to get the number. A measured number is any quantity you get by using some kind of an instrument to get the number. So if you use a rule of the measure length, the number you get is a measured number. If you use the mass, if you use a, 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 a balance to get the mass, then that's a measured number. If you come into the lab and you use one of the meters to get the voltage or the current or the resistance, then that's a measured number. So that's what we mean by measured numbers. In this class, now this isn't chemistry, but in this class, a significant digit is the, the number of a measured number that you're sure about, the digit that you're sure about. Well, what are you talking about, Singleton? Well, let me show you. Let's say I gave you something to measure, like, I said, all right, all right uh, student, measure this line. Measure this. How long is that line? So what you'll do is you'll go get some kind of uh, instrument, like a ruler, and you'll measure it. I'm going to just put some marks here. Now, I don't care what the units are. It could be inches, centimeters, miles. I don't care what the, I'm just going to say units. Doesn't matter what they are. So. If I measure this line, the only number I'm sure about is right here, this part right here, one, two, three. It's going to be three point. Now, anything other than that three is just a guess. Uh, Abdul, you might say, all right, that looks like about 3.25. Uh, Jacob might say, no, nah, it looks more like three point. Four, Michael might say, well, I don't know. It's almost 3.5. The point is, anything after the decimal point is just a guess. So what I mean by significant digit in this class, not chemistry, in this class, it's a number you're sure about, and the only thing we're sure about in here is the three. So on the sheet, what I have here for significant digit, the number of a measure that is known to be correct, the three here is known to be correct. What about error? Who can tell me what, what do we mean when we talk about error? What does that term mean? Error. What is that? I mean, just, just tell me what you think it is, because you're probably right. What is error? It's a problem that occurs. A problem that occurs? Okay. Anybody want to say that in a different way? A pro I think I know what he meant. What else? A problem that is incorrect. A problem that's incorrect, a measurement that's incorrect. What would cause a measurement to be incorrect? What might cause that? The instrument that you're using to measure might not be working properly. Exactly. So, for, for example, now I have a physics background, if you haven't noticed, and they always taught me when I was in physics school is when you, when you measure a length, like what I just showed you, when you measure the length of something with a meter stick, Never start your measurement right here. Why would I not want to start my measurement at the end of the meter stick? Why not? Because that's not zero. It's not zero. And even if the zero is there, a lot of times students and teachers, like when I was teaching physics, I would take my ruler and i use it. i hit students with it. i bang it on the table on the floor. And so what happens is you wear that down a little bit. So it might wear off a millimeter or something. So now you're off with your measurement. So there's might be some something wrong with the thing you're using the measure with, which means that error can come from the instrument. Where where else might error come from? Where else might it come from? User error. User error. 
there could be air something wrong with the instrument or could be something wrong with the way you looked at it. So error comes from the, the instrument itself or from the user. Okay. Now, what I really want to go out on, we're on the amount of time, so I'm over. If you guys got to sign off, that's fine. But I wanted to find quickly, I'll do this real quick. Accuracy and precision. Most lay the lay people, just the average person, they think they use these terms to mean the same thing. He's not precise, he's not accurate. But in this class, in engineering, they have very specific meanings, very specific meanings. And the easiest way to understand it is using this example I'm going to show you of a bullseye, a bullseye or target. So let's say I got a target. And here's the bullseye. And I got the rings around the target like a dartboard. Now, what the target represents is measured numbers. If you hit the bullseye, then your measurement is perfect. If you hit off to the side, well, that's a good measurement, but it's not as good as hitting the bullseye. And the further away you are from the bullseye, the worse your measurement. So let's say that this represents a measurement, and the person throwing darts or arrows at this represent the per it represents the value that the person gets wherever the dart hits on the board. Here's definition for accuracy. Accuracy is how close you are to the true value. Now, if I talk about our target, accuracy means how close you are to the true value. And the true value is right there, how close you are to the bullseye. And precision is how often you hit the same value. Let me say that one more time. Accuracy is how close you are to the true value. The true value is right there. And precision is how often you hit the same value. So let's say the person has three darts. They have a red dart and they throw it and it hits right here. They have a blue dart and they throw it and it hits right here. And finally they have a green dart and they throw it and it hits right here. According to the definition I just gave you, what would you say about the person, about the measurement? Very precise. It's very precise, but not accurate. It's precise because it hit the same point over and over and over again, but it's not accurate because it didn't hit the right point, the actual value, the true value. So an instrument can be precise, but not accurate. So now they're going to do it again. They're going to throw the blue dart or the green dart and hit right here. They're going to throw the blue dart and hit right here. And last but not least, they'll throw the red one and hit right there. Now what would you say? Precise and accurate. Exactly. That's the point, guys. Accurate because we hit the exact value. Precise because we hit that value over and over and over again. So accuracy deals with how close you are to the true value. And when we talk about precise, we're dealing with repeatability. That's what we mean by it in this class. In the other class, it might mean something else. In this class, you hear me use those words. That's what I'm talking about. Guys, thank you for hanging in there with me. I know I went over a little bit. Um, I'm going to stick around in case anybody has any questions or comments. But uh, have a safe weekend. Um, we just went through the material for the first chapter in the book, and I realized the book isn't in the bookstore yet. I don't know if I sent you a link to, uh, I can't remember if it was your class or another class. If you don't have a book to read, send me a text. And I can send you a link to a, I got like a, I got an electronic copy I can share with you. You want to get your own copy of the book, because what I have is the ninth edition, and you need the tenth, but the reading is the same in both of them. I want you to be able to read over the weekend. Keep up with the reading. So we just finished chapter one. Next week, we're going to chapter two. Chapter two deals with the nature of voltage, current, and resistance. And after we get done with that chapter, You'll know exactly what we mean by voltage. You'll know exactly what we mean by resistance, and you'll know exactly what we mean by current. You might think you know, but you probably don't. I don't know. You might. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. I'll stick around in case anybody has any questions for me. And other than that, guys, I'll see you on Monday. I got a question. Yeah, sure. All right. Go ahead. Ready? Yeah, uh, I missed my first class.
So I don't know if we uh, are we gonna use uh, the book or online book or are supposed to buy a book. I know nothing about it. You missed the first class. Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, yeah, you want to buy a book. Uh, the book is listed on the syllabus. And what I can do is send you a link to uh, a book that I have. It's a book that we use, but it's an older uh, version of it. But yeah, you want to go ahead and buy the book. Now, somebody told me the uh, bookstore was sold out and they don't have them in yet. I don't know. They may have them now, but there is a book for the class. There's actually two books. There's a textbook and there's a lab manual, and you need both of those. Okay. Can you send me a link, please? Yeah, I can send you the link. Uh, send me a text. You probably are. is that Abdul? Is it? It's Riley. Riley. Okay. So Riley, uh, there's a video. You can actually I recorded the first lecture. So if you missed that, uh, you can um, you can go to Blackboard and the video's there. If you have any trouble, okay. uh, you can ask me. If you can't find it, the video, let me know. But I will send you a link, a copy of the link, and you can look at the book. But um, you know, still buy your own, but you can use that to read, and that'll get you over the next week or two. Thank you. No problem. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, right. Is there a quiz for the weekend, did you say? or? Yeah, it's really simple. So I'm going to uh, I'm gonna ask a question that you'll know. You can't, you can't fail this quiz because it's like uh, – it's like your opinion. I, I don't know how to explain it, but I'm going to give you an assignment. I'm going to count as quiz one. If you, um, if we had actually met face to face, I always give this quiz on the first day and uh, ask a, what, you, what you know. You express your opinion on something, so it's nothing to worry about. The actual quiz, the one we got to really think about, will be next week. So I'll, I'll hand one out this week. I'll send it through uh, through Blackboard. You'll complete it in Blackboard and it'll submit it. You'll submit it to me through Blackboard. Okay, would that be on your assignments? It will be an assignment, right. It'll come to your, uh, you'll get an email and it'll be an announcement. All right. You'll, you'll see it. Yep. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Everybody else? And do, you, do we have any homework this week? Isn't the homework on Blackboard? Homework one? Yeah. I think it's, yeah, I think it's listed on Blackboard. It better be. It's due on uh, uh, Sunday. Uh, you know what? I I think I have it due Sunday. I might change that to give you. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't let me look. Hold on a second. I can't remember what I made to do that. Let me just check real quick. I don't want to tell you something wrong. I teach so many courses. I can't keep track of anything. So it looks like uh. I don't, I have a due on January 26th. January 26th. So I think that's plenty of time. Did you get that? Yeah. All right. Well, guys, if you don't have any more questions, I will see you later. How many dogs do you have? <laughs> I knew somebody was gonna ask me that. Well, uh, I'm down. I'm down to. I'm down to eight. <laughs> down I, started to eight. Off, I started off with eleven. I'm down to eight. And the more interesting story is how I got how 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 I ended up with so many dogs. So I'll tell you that. Right. All right. Yeah. Yeah.